Good morning. Hi, it's uh, Bill Joris, Alfredo, and myself from VSIG. Happy to have our honored guest today, Dr. Steve Crocker. Uh, let me do a short bio. Um, he's going to uh, have a, a great presentation this morning, as you can see on the screen, history from 1957 to early 1970s, the creation of Dharma. Uh, let me go over very quickly. Uh, Steve is a real busy guy, even though he's supposed to be retired, but he's the president of Edgemore Research Institute and CEO of Jinkuru. Uh He's the former chair and I believe the vice chair of ICANN. He's been involved with ICANN, IETF, a whole bunch of alphabet, alphabet soups. Uh, you may know him as one of the three amigos uh, with the, the beginning of the internet, uh, friends of his and associates, Vince Cerf, um, Robert Kahn, uh, John Postal and others. Uh, and he was there uh, right in the trenches at the beginning. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Uh, you all can hear me okay? <clears throat> yep, we can hear you great. Thank you. Good. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I'm battling a, a nagging cough, one of the ravages of aging a little bit. And so, um, uh, I'm going to take you back uh, a long, long time ago, and uh, so this is a, a bit of a history lesson, um, both about what the state of affairs was uh, computing-wise and some politics at the time, and uh, then the technology that lead, led to the creation of, uh, of both DARPA and, uh, and the ARPANET, which then led into the internet. Um, so uh, back in uh, 1957, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy were competing vigorously to put something up in space. And the result of that competition was they both lost. Uh, Russia, won, Russia won with Sputnik in 1957, which caused a very sharp reaction within the U.S. government. How did this happen to us uh, and what do we do in the future? Um, the uh, bureaucratic response was to create a new agency called the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which was uh, a small office put together inside, or a small agency put together inside of the Office of Secretary of Defense. So in terms of massive bureaucracies, we're talking about a, uh, a, a, a little pebble, if you will, uh, 150 people uh, inside of the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, which all told that office consisted of 2,000 people, which may seem enormous, uh, in most of our daily lives, but in the in in regard to the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense, was tiny. This was most importantly outside of the Army, Navy, or Air Force. It's plugged in right above above them into the top. Um, <coughs> some questions come up: uh, Is it ARPA or is it DARPA? It was created, as I said, as the Advanced Research Projects Agency, and then in 1972. It was moved out of the Office of Secretary of Defense and became a separate defense agency. For those of you who like org charts, this is great stuff for everybody else. It's boring as hell. Um, and it just caused uh, it to became known as the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. No change in mission, no change uh, to speak of in structure. Uh, I happened to be working there at the time and in the staff meeting where this was announced, the director of the agency said he now got to sign his own travel orders. Um, Later, under Bill Clinton in the, in the 90s, uh, with the big success of internet technology and other things, um, there was uh, an attempt to emphasize the dual use of the technology that was being created, uh, dual meaning both military and civilian. And so they renamed it back to ARPA. That lasted briefly, and then it got renamed back to DARPA, where it has been ever since. <laughs> the structure of the agency was uh, very flat. It consisted at the time I was there, and it varies over time a little bit, but basically the same idea, into a set of offices, each office having a particular focus. And at the time that I was there, it had six offices. Um, the ones on top that are in uh, bolder and, and bigger type were had bigger budgets, were focused on big time military uh, technology issues, um, nuclear monitoring office uh, was um, uh, trying to detect uh, underground explosions in, in Russia or in Soviet Union at the time, using uh, microphones uh, in various places, including large arrays of uh, microphones being towed by a submarine underwater. Um, 
one of the more uh, uh, attention getting projects in the strategic technology office was to see if you could put a laser uh, weapon in an airplane and uh, aim it uh, down at the ground. Uh, project was large, expensive. Uh, when the project got to be too big to fit into a, a 707, they got a, a 747 as the platform. And when it got too big to fit in 747, they had to shut it down. So that just gives you an idea of the size of the experiments and going on. And then uh, uh, there were also uh, much lower budgets uh, focused on much, much longer timeframes, uh, new research in materials and behavioral sciences, and the information processing techniques office, which was what has generated <coughs> all of the technology that we're using today, including this very talk. Um, because the budgets were small, uh, they could be protected uh, and didn't come on uh, the same uh, uh, level of scrutiny as the, as the bigger expensive one. So here's uh, some things that were well known. The first thing it, uh, that ARPA did was pull together the space program and uh, put the pieces together. And NASA on the civilian side came out of it. And then the Air Force uh, had the, uh, the primary military space technology. Uh, the Vietnam War was going on. There were all kinds of things related to the war that were attempted. But the critical thing is that the attempts were for serious big changes, not small changes. So slogans were a factor of 10, not 10%. And the other uh, dominant mode of operation was to spend significant amounts of money, get in, make a difference, and then get out, transfer the technology, leave it to industry or to other parts of the Defense Department. Less well-known, but very, very important, was the agility that the agency had. It did not have to go through an extensive justification uh, cycle uh, with a lot of bureaucracy. It had uh, what was called the blanket determination and findings and uh, which is usually a prerequisite before kicking off a new new effort. And it also had extraordinary uh, latitude in getting contracts written. Uh, for those of you who have spent time in bureaucracies, this makes a huge difference. Uh, I won't spend more time on it, but I can tell you that it was uh, uh, a magic almost in terms of being able to make things happen. Um, in terms of money, um, these are some numbers from uh, quite a long time ago from, uh, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and how much money was spent in different kinds of uh, different parts of the defense budget. Uh, uh, the research development test and evaluation budget is nominally a small percentage of the overall uh, defense budget, uh, you know, call it 10%, if you will. Uh, and DARPA was 4% of that, so a tiny portion of the overall defense budget. Um, meanwhile, what was happening out in the real world was that computers in the 1960s were very big and expensive. They were big mainframes, uh, usually took up uh, a room that had air conditioning and a false floor so you could run big cables underneath. And the computers were used in batch processing mode. Uh, and the primary support for research uh, was coming from the National Science Foundation, and the money they spent on computers at universities were to support other uh, uh, disciplines, uh, physics um, <coughs> notably. But in a few places, there was the idea that computers should be useful for individuals doing research or uh, interaction. So time-sharing systems, uh, uh, graphics, uh, initial forays into man-machine interaction and artificial intelligence research. And that was that locus of activity, which was tiny compared to the rest of the country and the rest of the industry, uh, found a home at DARPA uh, and the office that I referred to before, Information Processing Techniques Office, was created in 1962. So ARPA had been going for a few years. Um, the first things that happened was setting up major centers of research at MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, Stanford, Berkeley, and others, um, focusing on time-sharing systems, artificial intelligence, um, advanced graphics, and um, uh, investigations into how to use multiple computers, sort of the architecture problem leading to supercomputers, and a vision about one day connecting computers together. 
Uh, here's uh, pictures of some of the pioneers, Al Perlis, John McCarthy, Alan Newell, Marvin Minsky, Herb Simon, uh, all major figures and uh, uh, colorful in their own right. Um, the other big thing going on is that the basic technology and electronics was improving rather dramatically and continued and continued and continued to improve. Um, Gordon Moore at Intel formulated what became known as Moore's Law, that there was a factor of 10 improvement every five years. There's nothing in all of human experience that has ever changed that dramatically and continuously over a long period of time. So if you change by a factor of 10 every five years, you're, in 10 years, you've got a hundredfold improvement. And in 40 years, how big is that number? That's 100 million times better. Or if you put it on an annual basis as if it was uh, like a bank account growing with interest, that's 60% improvement year after year after year after year. Absolutely huge. And it has uh, been obviously one of the primary drivers, things that we could only dream about in the early days are now available at your corner store for a few bucks. Uh, meanwhile, there was actually some also, also some work going on in understanding uh, computer science issues more deeply, new, new algorithms, uh, graphics, speech understanding, uh, all of that was science fiction of the day, and now we use it every day. Uh, and AI, of course, which has become the darling when we were putting uh, the initial funding into artificial intelligence, uh, the question is, would anybody believe us and, or think that we were just wasting our time and uh, fantasizing? Uh, and how would you justify spending that money? And the primary answer was, well, keep it small enough so that nobody notices more or less, not quite that bad, but something like that. Here's a, a, a picture illustrating those numbers. Uh, that's a, a log scale on the left, factors of 10, and time on the uh, uh, on the bottom scale on the x-axis, um, and uh, getting back to the budget. Um, so I said how small uh, the the DARPA budget was compared to overall D and D, and then within DARPA the IPTO budget the, the was five percent, and AI was about a seventh of that. So we're talking about AI, for example, being about one percent of the ARPA or DARPA budget. Uh, all of which, as I said before, was a very, very small portion of the overall defense budget. On the other hand, the amount of money was significant enough to make things happen. Uh, $2 million a year in 1965 translated into about 50 man years worth of effort. Uh, 50 man years of effort today cost quite a bit more than that, but this gives you some idea of that. So I uh, spread that money through the universities in the places where you think that smart people are doing interesting work and do it consistently over a period of time and really nice things happen. So as I said, part of the vision in setting all this up was that one day you get computers connected to each other. And the there were a number of not successful small efforts, which then uh, led to a decision in roughly 1965-66 to say, okay, let's go connect up the research laboratories together and uh, really try to make a go of this networking stuff from a research point of view, see if we can make it happen. <laughs> so the networking technology prior to them was very specialized. There were a few, there were some military systems, there was American Airlines had its reservation system. These were generally a small number of computers that were all of the same kind uh, and even so, the results were mixed. Um, and so for ARPA to push forward in this area was a big deal, particularly because the research laboratories did not have common hardware or software. Uh, there was uh, quite a bit of diversity. Uh, and so just the idea of connecting all these together was uh, complicated. And the second was that uh, these connections were supposed to provide um, interactive use, not just computer to computer batch use. So not just transferring a file or a message, but actually being able to uh, uh, do uh, remote use of certain form. So here's a picture, uh, a diagram of the initial ARPANET that consisted of just four sites, uh, three in California and one in Utah, all in the Western part of the United States. Um, the computers are in the uh, rectangular boxes. So there was an IBM 360, a scientific data systems 940, another scientific data system Sigma 7, 
uh, which became a Xerox company, and a digital equipment, uh, uh, PDP-10 at Utah. And the circles are, the, are what you would now call routers, but they were re, uh, sort of small refrigerator-sized uh, uh, machines. I'll show you a picture. There's, there's a picture of the first input, we called it, the interface message processor, a router. Um, and uh, there was one of these at each site, and then they were connected to the to the computers that people were actually using. And then the important part is that there was a a long distance telephone line that was permanently connected, so this is an open line, not a dial up. Um, and these were uh, extraordinarily fast, unbelievably fast, fifty thousand bit per second uh, uh, lines. Uh, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek, of course because uh, you can't get anything that runs that slow today. But a regular dial-up line, you could get 1,200 bits per second, maybe 2,400 uh, if you were lucky uh, in those days. And in order to achieve that kind of speed, 50,000, there was actually the equivalent of 12 lines that were bonded together to, pr to uh, provide that kind of bandwidth. Um, so the purpose of this network was, uh, as I said before, a strong emphasis on interactive computing and to facilitate uh, a number of different kinds of uses, including the potential for having more than one computer participating in the same problem. Uh, and a lot of focus on cooperation across the laboratories at both the computer level and the people to people level. Uh, and so it, it sort of foster a lot of different things that, uh, that are happening. A, a key technical issue is how to make efficient use of this long distance communication lines, which were very expensive for the day. Um, data communications tends to, particularly interactive, tends to be very bursty. So uh, somebody will type something and then wait, <coughs> and then a, a burst of uh, information will come back and then wait some more time. So if you measure how much data is actually being transmitted, uh, the line is empty most of the time for a simple uh, communication between, say, a person and a remote computer. <laughs> so sharing sharing those lines for having multiple conversations in progress was absolutely central. And that's what leads to the idea of packet switching, which is the way everything works today, but was considered to be quite uh, adventuresome, shall we say. Now, one of the questions that comes up was, well, <coughs> and particularly it comes up because packet switching has a natural survival um, characteristic that if a line goes down, you could reroute the packets around another path. So that between that and the fact that this was supported by the Defense Department, uh, a common guess is, oh, this must have been research at trying to build a nuclear survivable uh, system in case we had all out nuclear warfare. <laughs> That's a, uh, a big overreach. Excuse me just a second. Um, um, there were a few words said about that, but it was definitely not part of the design or uh, goal structure uh, for the early research. Uh, I could go on at some length about it, but bad things happen if you uh, are going to imagine nuclear warfare. Uh, first of all, you lose a good portion of your capability. And second of all, the demand goes way up. And so you're operating in a very ugly part of the design space that uh, that was not where we were at all. Uh, further, this was a unclassified uh, system that was being used by students and faculty at universities. Uh, everything was wide open. Um, the long-term view was if this technology paid off, then you would formulate other projects later that would go into the more uh, direct uh, military use, which is what happened. Here's a picture, as I said, of what that router looked like. You can buy this today and Wi-Fi and other capabilities packaged for 20 to 30, 50 bucks at a local store. This was $100,000 uh, package in 1969. And those dollars would be worth, uh, I mean, that would be worth a half a million dollars today or more. Uh, it was capable of connecting to three or four computers and three or four high-speed lines. Um, why, why are the numbers indistinct? Because it had seven ports on it inside. 
And so you could have three of one and four of the other, but not four of each. Um, packet switching, which I've mentioned, has, it, it can be compared to circuit switching. To set up a circuit takes several seconds uh, and you get usually less than 1% utilization and the rest is just uh, empty space on the circuit. Packet switching is set up immediately and you get much, much higher efficiency. On the other hand, uh, circuit switching, once you've got it set up, uh, the delays are very uh, fixed and uh, you don't have any variability and it costs you about 10 microseconds per mile. Uh, that's half the speed of light, which is what happens when you when you push uh, signals through, through copper. Um, packet switching, not so nice. In addition to the speed of light issues, you also have the hops through each uh, router and the delivery times aren't necessarily the same. So you get what we see today when you do speech over packet switch things. Uh, it's not nearly as smooth as it used to be. On the other hand, it's much, much cheaper and uh, much more flexible. So here's a general timeline. Um, the concepts were developed uh, in the 66 to 68 range. A, uh, the, uh, one of the formal dates is that a request for quotes to build the routers was put out in uh, July 68. A first meeting of representatives from the first four sites took place in August 68. Uh, there had been a senior group of advisors uh, that formed what, what they call themselves a network working group. Uh, and this meeting in August 68 uh, had graduate students or comparable second level staff from each of the places. As it happened, Vince Cerf and I were uh, at UCLA at the time. The meeting was held uh, at, in Santa Barbara. So we drove up and uh, we met our counterparts there from the others. Um, and what we discovered was that there was no grand plan for what the hosts were actually going to say to each other. A lot of work gone on to how to connect them together, how to build the packet switch, not so much in terms of the planning. Uh, BBN won the contract and started work in 69 and delivered <laughs> the first router to UCLA in uh, uh, September that year. Um, and the deliveries of the imps were roughly monthly after that and the network started to be built. Meanwhile, this informal group of uh, students uh, met intermittently and uh, in April 69, we initiated a very short-term tentative list of notes that we called requests for comments in order to make it clear that these were uh, informal and didn't have any authority. And we expected that to run for six to six months to a year. Uh, you would have uh, astonished me if you had said, oh, they're going to continue indefinitely and become the basis for the design and documentation of the uh, network protocols. Here's what uh, the network expanded uh, several months later, June of 1970. You see the cross-country lines <coughs> connecting MIT, Bull Brannock and Newman, and Harvard uh, in the uh, Cambridge area and uh, a few more in the Los Angeles area. Um, 1977, all of a sudden the, uh, the network is too big to put on a map like that, or at least uh, it gets very dense. And uh, the network of course has grown enormously since then. Um, now, uh, a few words about the ARPANET versus the internet. So the ARPANET was the collect connection of a diverse set of sites with different machines, different operating systems and so forth, but with a common uh, subnet, uh, all using the same technology of the, these imps, all provided by one company, Bull Brannock and Newman, and all run as a single network. There was one network uh, operation center uh, that BBN ran. It was clear almost instantly that there would be a need to have multiple networks and that they should be interconnected. Those multiple networks were going to arise from, uh, let's say, three different reasons, uh, at least. One is even within uh, the office that was supporting all of this, the, uh, there was a desire to experiment with other modes 
radios and satellites. Uh, uh, now, satellites obviously are radio-based, but uh, when I say radio, I'm talking about ground-based radios. Uh, so there was research on a packet radio network and a separate research on a packet satellite network. And uh, you don't want to build all these different networks and not have them intercommunicate. So that's one reason why you have multiple networks and you want to interconnect them. Meanwhile, uh, other parts of the government were very interested, National Science Foundation, the, the uh, Energy Department, uh, and NASA, for example, uh, all paid attention. Uh, NASA and uh, the Energy Department wanted to connect their laboratories, and so they started to put money into building their own networks. Well, you don't want to do that without, uh, unless you interconnect them all in some ways. And of course, nobody wanted to be under the control of anybody else. And then that's just uh, local politics within the U.S. All around the world, people wanted to build networks. And so you had the international situation of different networks uh, being initiated by different countries. I can tell you, sitting as a graduate student in the 69, 70, 71 period at UCLA, we had visits from uh, delegations from uh, Canada and from uh, uh, France, for example, that I remember quite vividly. Uh, the Canadians wanted to connect their universities. Uh, if you look at the Canadian geography, uh, most of the population is uh, on the southern edge of Canada, which means just over the border from uh, the northern part of the U.S. And uh, uh, some of their major universities are spread east-west along the, that, that boundary. And I remember they came and said they wanted their data to flow east-west, not north-south, meaning they did not want to build their network in a way that moved their data into the U.S. and then along U.S. routes and then back up into Canada. They wanted a certain amount of autonomy. Um, and similar kinds of thinking was true in, in every other country. So the ability to connect internationally was another major force. All of that led to uh, the need to <coughs> take whatever lessons came out of the ARPANET and apply them to the more complicated problem of how do you interconnect uh, multiple networks. So uh, the ARPANET continued to expand and develop and uh, uh, protocols were designed. Uh, you, uh, there was uh, data collected on reliability, uh, various operational issues were straightened out and uh, uh, all kinds of things were created. Email was created, uh, you know, it was Telnet and FTP, and then much later, um, I guess even after the internet came along, uh, HTTP and, and uh, the World Wide Web got created. Um, meanwhile, certain parts of the military started to pay attention to the technology. Uh, in 83, the ARPANET was split into two parts, uh, one that continued for the research community and the one that was uh, uh, took the exact same technology and used it within the Defense Department for uh, uh, communication uh, within the military. And when we're talking about communication within the military, not talking about uh, war fighting, you know, in a hot fire situation, but even mundane things like uh, 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 moving uh, uh, men and material around uh, and uh, all, all the uh, bureaucracy, a huge amount of bureaucracy inside the Defense Department. So in 1983, TCP IP uh, protocol was designed as a replacement for the original set of base protocols on the ARPANET. And in January 83, the, uh, the internet uh, began. And then uh, several years later, the last pieces of the ARPANET were turned off. So the ARPANET game plan, as I uh, alluded to, was to connect these research sites. Uh, these research sites had the advantage that all of the people there were computer scientists or budding computer scientists doing research. So uh, as a whole, we were pretty competent in terms of uh, software uh, and the hardware. Uh, we knew about operating systems. We knew about programming languages. And so uh, uh, sort of a a ready-made team of people uh, and, and being paid at student rates, so we were cheap, um, and uh, sort of plunged into what could we do with this thing without 
having any uh, organized plan ahead of time. So uh, I mentioned a senior technology group. Uh, they had participated in the major decisions about the use of 50 kilobit lines, uh, the, the packet switching, uh, using a separate computer for the routers as opposed to connecting the computers directly to each other. And uh, the higher levels of the design, what you're gonna do with this, had been left a little vague. Obviously you wanted to be able to connect remotely to other computers. Uh, obviously you wanted to be able to move a file from one place to another, but there had not been a lot of detailed uh, planning and thinking and uh, design about all that and sort of a, a field of dreams, let everybody figure it out once it's there. So uh, that brought, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, sort of next level down people. Um, there's a saying in academia that graduate students are the second lowest form of life. And uh, as I also mentioned, fairly inexpensive as these things go. So uh, a, a few people from each site started to think about what are we gonna do with this and interact with each other. And that led to the formation of um, uh, informally of a working group call ourselves a network working group, which was just a continuation of the other one. And then trying to think from first principles, uh, what, what are we gonna to say to each other and decided uh, very quickly that we wanted a flexible open architecture. <laughs> and one piece of that is even though this was circuit, it was a packet switch that a useful abstraction was to think in terms of a virtual circuit so that you could open up a path from one place to another and then just keep pushing data uh, through that path and it would wind up at the other end. Uh, but it had to be, again, because it was a research environment and we did not have a very specific closed picture of what all this is gonna be used for, but that it had to be an open framework that would be added on and modified and evolve over a period of time. Um, the base protocol, uh, we call very blandly the host host protocol. <laughs> Although uh, uh, for very modest reasons, it became later known as the network control protocol. And later it got replaced by the transmission control protocol, TCP. Uh, what we discovered was that uh, it wasn't quite as simple as we thought it would be. Uh, there needed to be some mechanism for the uh, receiving side of a connection to be able to say, hey, wait, hold on, I don't have any more room, slow down, uh, what we call the flow control problem. And also, particularly for interactive computing, if you're interacting with a remote process and that remote process uh, has a bug in it, you wanna be able to hit a button and say, hey, stop. So you need to be able to interrupt. Um, <laughs> so our protocols needed a way convey not only the major pieces of data that we wanted to send, but to have a separate uh, uh, interruption mechanism. Uh, and all of this required digging into the operating systems that came with each of our uh, big time shared systems and sort of cutting those open and adding code, uh, which meant that you had to get root access and you had to know your way around inside that code. Uh, so that's where a lot of the time and energy went in those days. Uh, uh, further, as I mentioned, the internet um, evolved out of this ARPANET. It was a homogeneous network with heterogeneous computers. Um, we learned a few lessons. In the days when we put together the ARPANET, 8-bit bytes had not yet been standardized. ASCII was not yet standardized for uh, for as character set. Uh, by the time, but <laughs> when it was time to evolve to the transmission control protocol, those that settled down and we switched from using bits as the unit of measure to 8-bit bytes. And then of course, in order to connect multiple networks together, we had to uh, insert another layer of protocol underneath the uh, virtual circuit uh, idea and that's the internet protocol layer that emerged out of that work. Um, that's the technical side. On the people side, um, communities began to form. Uh, this ad hoc group of graduate students morphed from 
uh, meetings of eight to 10 uh, people into uh, really big unwieldy meetings. We had 50 people show up at a meeting in Atlantic City. Uh, and uh, so we had to start to get organized, split into multiple working groups. Uh, IETF meetings, the Internet Engineering Task Force, now has meetings of 1,000 to 2,000 people uh, three times a year uh, all over the world, plus, of course, <coughs> working groups, uh, email, internet drafts, et cetera, et cetera. What are the main results from the ARPANET? Well, first of all, that networks actually could be built. That was not clear in advance. And that once you build one, everybody wants to join and became a big motive, uh, motivating force. Uh, we learned that we could build a heterogeneous network that were not specific to different vendors. Uh, in those early days, IBM tried to build its own protocol suite. Digital Equipment tried to build its own protocol suite. Uh, and there were other similar efforts. All of those gave way to an open architecture and a common protocol across. Uh, there were also competitions even at that level, OSI versus uh, TCP IP suite. Uh, the layered protocol architecture was pretty successful that we can add functionality on top of, underneath, in between, etc. cetera. Um, and there was uh, a very big emphasis on openness, an open protocol stack that you could expand and change, an open standards process, all of the documentation was available to anybody who wanted it anywhere around the world. That was a big change, not one that we thought about in political terms or so it just seemed natural, but it turned out to be qualitatively different from the way other standards efforts worked. Uh, and uh, not only can people get free documentation, but anybody can participate. You wanna design a protocol, you wanna go comment on one that's being developed, no problem. That again was in sharp contrast to uh, other standards efforts that were typically government controlled. And you had, if you wanted to participate in a government uh, delegation, then you had to be uh, uh, sort of added to it in some way uh, that was usually controlled by companies that interacted with in the US, the State Department and in other countries, uh, the corresponding parts of their governments. So um, somewhat, um, informally, but nonetheless quite effectively, uh, we had very sharp changes in um, uh, the, the culture and the organizational structures that, ma that matched the equally sharp changes in the architecture and technology that we were dealing with. Uh, so I'm emphasizing here these three forms of openness and that have carried us through uh, to modern times. Um, in the internet, uh, the IP protocol is the joining uh, uh, technology, and there is a huge amount of uh, sort of the common technology. And above that, you have a multitude of protocols at the application layer. And equally below that, you have a multitude of different technologies for transmission. Um, so you have multiplicity of uses and a diversity of transmission mechanisms. And if you look at the top part, you see the uh, acronyms, just a few. There's actually uh, an, an extraordinary number of different protocols. Some are for relatively small uses. Others are for what we use every day. And of course, a lot of products uh, developed on top of that. So you have the web and the email, DNS used for the domain name system, SIP for voice communication and so forth. And uh, in terms of looking at where the innovation comes from, uh, not restricted to any particular set of organizations or countries um, uh, who would have expected, for example, that uh, it would be Estonia where Skype was created and uh, that became uh, one of the most important uh, changes in communication. I don't think anybody would have been able to find uh, Estonia on a map in those days when we were working on it, just as an example. Um, so that's my short forced march through that historical period. And I would be delighted to take questions. We have, I think, 15 minutes or, or perhaps more. And uh, I'm happy to engage in however you want. Over to you. I'm good. Great, great. Thank you so much. I, I'm astounded. You're saying uh, 
you were coughing because of age, but it hasn't affected your memory or recall. It's, it's absolutely astounding how you put this together and it's, it, it just comes off, rolls off your, your tongue so naturally. Uh, it's so detailed, so compact. Uh, so really, really quite valuable information. Um, Dr. Olivier Carpin LeBlanc has done a great job on our history uh, sessions, but this, this session today is, is phenomenal. Uh, I really do appreciate, and, and Alfredo and, and Bill as well. So um, let me turn to Alfredo and Bill. Uh, so guys, go ahead. Um, okay, this is Bill Gerais. I'm, uh, I'm sitting here thinking of missed opportunities because uh, I was at Berkeley, um, an undergraduate in the late 60s, and the... Uh, I took the one and only computer course that was available at the time, but it seems like uh, if I'd been paying attention at that point, there were uh, opportunities that I could have gotten in on the ground floor, but uh, I got in eventually. So uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch how the whole thing uh, evolved and certainly at least my recollection of where things were, and I was close to uh, Lawrence Livermore and such, where uh, openness was, shall we say, not a high priority, um, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly. But they got connected to this, and the whole thing, uh, it, from what from what I see, the uh, the whole openness, you can come as an individual and we don't much care who you work for or where you live, um, has been preserved, but it's not, uh, even today, it's not a foregone conclusion. And every now and then there are little spats about, gee, this company or this country or whatever is trying to... Uh, pack various committees so they can do things their way. Um, it hasn't seemed to succeed so far, but it's it's interesting that the uh, it's an ongoing uh, challenge rather than uh, something that's set in stone. With luck, we'll keep winning the battles. Right. Well, you wanna... yeah, well, um, you know, I think it's, it's sort of a, a deep... Uh, observation on a human behavior up and down and across all realms that you have a mixture of cooperation and competition and uh, the tension between those two uh, forces plays out in, uh, you know in every setting that we know of uh, even you know everywhere from uh, local family interactions to uh, interaction between nations and so forth so uh, uh, and so we discover, that uh, although there are a few things that are special in computer science, there are also many things that are just common because you're dealing with human nature uh, in, in all of its different guises. So, so Steve, uh, this is Alfredo. Uh, I, I had the opportunity in the 80s and 90s uh, to work at uh, university institutions where research was, was a huge component, especially in health and in medicine. So I was part of the uh, Internet 2 uh, team uh, here in the island, here in Puerto Rico in the late 80s and early 90s. So can you talk a little bit more about how that happened, the division between the normal or the commercial Internet and Internet 2? I know a little. I don't know. Uh, I, during that period, I was really focused on uh, a different kind of uh, research. So I'll say a few words, but not uh, everything. Um, this expansion of uh, networking, uh, you know, took place, uh, and, and it felt explosive at every single stage. So you had this exponential growth, and a feature of exponential growth is that everything before that looks like nothing and everything ahead of that looks like everything. And uh, you move forward five, 10 years and you say, oh, everything is just starting now. And uh, meanwhile, it's been exploding in the past years. 
so the the uh, expansion of networking um, and the impact from computer science, sort of internal computer science, I'll say, to other fields, and particularly health and education and, and uh, uh, many other fields, um, took place. <coughs> and new people came in and uh, plunged into it, jumped into it, and became very active. And new communities started. And so you had this recreation uh, or you know continual creation of communities of interest across uh, all of these different disciplines uh, in every country and region in the world and so forth. Um, uh, nobody could follow all of it, but that was a good thing in a sense that it was bigger than any, any single person in control. And then um, within the US, the networks were limited for uh, government and academic use until around 1990, 1991, when things started to open up for commercial interconnections. And so there's a whole story to tell about uh, the permission to connect MCI mail to the network without general interconnection. Vint Cerf uh, was very, very active in all of that, Bob Kahn <coughs> and Steve Wolf at NSF. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, so here's a small anecdote. Uh, when the domain name system was created, there were seven top level domains, uh, com, net, org, <coughs> ARPA, mil, gov, um, and edu, I think. I think I got them all. And uh, .net was for networks, uh, for I ISPs and so forth. Org was for the nonprofits, edu for the universities. And com was for those few commercial uh, companies that was going to be connected. Uh, of course, Com now is uh, more or less like half of everything and uh, grew well beyond what anybody was thinking about at the time. Um, and so you have all the stresses on the domain name system, but just gives you a, a moment in time. <laughs> Gov and Mill were both government, uh, limited to government sites, Mill for the Defense Department and Gov for everybody else. When other countries came on, um, so you have like, say, UK, and then within UK, you have a geo.uk for the government and AC for the, for the equivalent of EDU for the academic networks. Um, so you have a lot of imbalance uh, that just reflects that initial assignments uh, as to where the action was. And then you map that today as to how things are growing. You say, well, if you're going to do it fresh, you wouldn't allocate it uh, the way it is you'd make it, you know, you'd probably put everything, uh, all of those under .us, for example. Alfredo, you're, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, Th thank you for that, uh, Steve. Uh, Glenn, back to you. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, you know, you have uh, uh, an illustrious career. Is there any regrets or or saying, damn, I should have, I, I should have took that other job, which is going to pay me millions or, or is there anything looking back at this long history of, of being seminal in, in this change? Is there any regrets or any things you would have liked to see done slightly different? Um, I wouldn't say regrets, but uh, I'll share with you a, uh, uh, a little story. Um, I spent time as a graduate student at UCLA, and then I went off to work at DARPA and uh, uh, become part of the machine that handed out the money supporting research. I had been interested in artificial intelligence and viewed this networking stuff as useful to do, but not as serious as you know really deep research. So I concentrated on AI when I was at DARPA, and then I uh, uh, spent a few years there and then came back to Los Angeles, and uh, I had interrupted my graduate work in uh, my thesis work. And I insisted uh, that I was going to uh, do work in formal proof techniques, which was at the time, in my mind, related to trying to understand the thought processes and uh, sort of AI-ish related. Um, and, um, and meanwhile, uh, my friend Bob Metcalf had been a graduate student at MIT and, uh, and he went off to Xerox Park and he came and visited me while I was in Washington. Um, and I showed him uh, a paper on the Aloha net. And I thought, eh, this is cute stuff. And uh, uh, he looked at all that and uh, had some qualms about 
the math that was in there, and he went back to Xerox and created the Ethernet. So I had uh, it stayed at my house, and I, I left him the reading material for the night, as it were. So I had the distinct privilege of being the host of the father of the Ethernet. <laughs> uh, so a few years later, he goes off to form 3Com, and he asked me if I would be one of the founders. And at that point, I had finished my uh, 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 thesis and was plunged into serious research on formal proof techniques. And I said, no, I want to I want to do research. I don't want to go into industry and so forth. So I turned down the offer to be a, a founder of 3Com. Um, it would have made a few more dollars than I made at the time as, as, a, as a researcher. Um, but you asked about regrets. One of the things that I uh, can report, uh, you know, with a mild amount of pride, but certain, but but just as a sort of matter of fact, is that uh, we we have no regrets, and I use we in the sense of my wife and I, uh, and, and we say, hey, that's great, glad for glad for Bob and his crew, uh, and we bought some three com stock many years later. Uh, but uh, you know, do I look back and say, damn, I missed the boat there? Uh, not really uh, did what I wanted and uh, some of it worked and some of it didn't. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's just part of the uh, part of what happens. Yeah, I, I think that's a very wise uh, observation. Uh, when I said regrets, I didn't mean it in a in a negative way that, oh, I could have been a millionaire. It's just that you had so many choices. You could have went the doors were opening for you because I'm sure you were desired by these emerging companies that said, Hey, we need somebody like you that, that, so I guess uh, I'm, I'm getting at it. And I'm, I'm not trying to get you to be reflective and say, Oh shit, I could be on a, on a yacht sipping champagne. <laughs> That's not, not the intentions. You got to make, you got to make decisions, uh, you know, make choices in life. And, uh, uh, if you spend your time thinking, boy, I, I should have done that instead of this, uh, endless amount of grief. Don't do it. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit of what your current projects are. I, I mentioned it in the, the beginning, uh, your company and, and, and your, um, so is there, you, and you alluded to the fact that you were doing research on AI. Is, is there any particular focus you have currently? Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, that's right. I, I remember you mentioned uh, uh, Shinkuro. Uh, we started Shinkuro several years ago thinking that sharing files was too hard. And uh, uh, we started up an effort and got it going, but it got overtaken by uh, Dropbox and other uh, many other technologies today. So uh, that company, and we use the company for other purposes, but that company we shut down this year. Uh, so my attention is focused on um, Edgemore Research Institute, and uh, uh, I spent quite a long time involved with ICANN, uh, and one of the things that I observed at ICANN was that it was having enormous amount of trouble sorting out the who is problem. Uh, this is the domain name registration data, and uh, what data should be collected, and uh, who should have access to it. And it's become a very big political problem and a complicated technical problem. And uh, uh, the time I spent at inside of ICANN was at a, a senior level. I had been uh, the founding chair of the Security Stability Advisory Committee and then got on the board and served on the board a very long time, first as a non-voting liaison, but nonetheless inside the boardroom and then a regular board member and then the last six and a half years as the chair of the board. And I observed the uh, the sort of semi-political, semi-technical processes uh, called the policy development process inside of ICANN, try to grapple with how do you set the policy for what data should be collected and who should have access to it. And it ran afoul over and over again, over repeatedly over several years. When I left the board uh, in 2017, uh, I was effectively retired and did not have a, uh, a, a major agenda that I wanted to pursue. Uh, but this problem gnawed at me. Uh, I was really quite uh, annoyed at how ineffective that process was. I gathered together a handful of people who were equally frustrated and also very knowledgeable about all the different aspects, technical, political, business aspects. And we worked 
quietly without portfolio off to the side, thinking about the problem. And then we got to a point where we had some nice results. And the question was, how do we share those and make those available to others? And I realized I was going to need some help. Oh, bother. That means I got to get some money to pay people. That means I got to have a place to put the money. So uh, we created Edgemore Research Institute, which is a, a nonprofit, a 501c3. Uh, we've got a very small amount of money uh, funding, <coughs> and we've been pursuing that. That's where I've been spending the bulk of my energy these days. I've also carried over some long-term interest in DNS security, uh, the DNSSEC protocol, there's still technical work, uh, amazingly, that needs doing there, and I've continued that. So that's what I'm spending my time on these days. Um, and uh, I don't play uh, tennis or golf or uh, have a sailboat anymore. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we can all relate to that. We, you know, it's it's glamorous when you watch these commercials. People are are climbing mountains they're on their yachts everything else by taking a pill uh we're all pretty boring so uh but you know this has been a delightful call and it's and it's wonderful to see you again virtually and and i hope to see you in a couple of weeks if you are traveling i'll be in istanbul great we'll be glad to get together on behalf of alfredo and, and bill myself Thank you so much again. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we'll add this to our history module. We have over 200 recordings. Uh, we're into our 11th version of our English English course and our Spanish course, I believe. Five or six, Alfredo. Uh, six. So, so we, uh, we're really happy to have you again. Well, thank you very much. And let me, let me return the compliment. Um, what you guys are doing is enormously important, bringing in uh, students from all over the world, and uh, uh, th this is a renewal process that uh, keeps things going and uh, it brings in uh, new ideas, uh, new blood, new energy, and uh, uh, kudos to you guys for uh, being so consistent about pursuing this year after year. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, this concludes the call today, and we'll be sharing the recording. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.